We spent a decade focused on Afghanistan and Iraq, but should we have paid more attention to Iran and this nuclear program? Next on Global Perspectives, we'll talk to an expert who thinks so. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Hello and welcome to the Global Perspectives show. America's long wars in Afghanistan and Iraq have been critical foreign policy concerns for two presidents. Now we are reaching the presumed end of both. And what does the record tell us? Have we accomplished our goals in Afghanistan and Iraq? Were the interventions truly necessary? Could the wars have been conducted differently? What lessons have we learned that could guide us in future conflicts? Today's guest, Bing West, is a noted military affairs correspondent and author. A correspondent for the Atlantic, he specializes in military, national security, and geopolitical issues. West was also an assistant secretary of defense under former President Ronald Reagan and has written a number of military-themed novels, including The Wrong War and No True Glory. Hello, Mr. West. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, John. Tell us a little bit about how you got into these major conflicts in Afghanistan and Iraq. Obviously, you've had the military as a focal area for many, many years, but how did your interest get directed toward these two in such a significant way? Basically, I'm, I'm a grunt. I'm a Marine, uh, and you never get over that. Uh, I understand infantry combat. I fought in Vietnam. I had written two books about Vietnam, one of them called The Village, which was about a combined action platoon of Marines and Vietnamese who fought in a remote village for 485 days. So when we were going into Iraq for the invasion of Iraq, a former Marine Major General by the name of Ray E. Tool Smith and I said, well, we'll go over there and take a look at what these young guys are doing. And after that, I wrote one book about going to Baghdad, and then I wrote a second book about the battle for Fallujah, and a third book about a history of the war. Then I moved on to Afghanistan and wrote a book about the history of that war. So for the last eight years, because my children were grown and I could get back to what I wanted to do, I got back on the battlefields as an old grunt. So I've been out now with about 60 or 70 different platoons throughout Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and I understand them, and they understand me. Why don't we step back from these two conflicts for just a second to where you were before we went into Afghanistan and where you were before we went into Iraq. Were these interventions that you personally supported? Did you think they were the right moves at the right time? And then we'll get into the aftermath. Well. We went into Afghanistan because 3,000 Americans were murdered in New York City at the Twin Towers. As far as I was concerned, and I think I would hope as far as every American would be concerned, you don't turn the other cheek when you have killers like that. You go out and you put them six feet under. So absolutely, I believe it was the right thing to do to go into Afghanistan to get those terrorists, and by getting them, I mean to destroy them, and by destroying, I mean you kill them. Iraq, I was in favor of the Iraq war because I, like a majority of the people in the White House, a majority of the people in the Congress, a majority of the people in the nation, and a majority of our allies around the world, believed that Saddam Hussein, who was the tyrant in charge of Iraq, had weapons of mass destruction, biologic and chemical and that he had linkages with the terrorists and such a hatred for us that his ability to hand some of those weapons to our enemies, which would then kill Americans, was very high. It turned out that intelligence belief was incorrect. However, at the time, we didn't know it was incorrect. 
So coulda, shoulda, woulda, can we go back and rewrite history? No. But if you ask me, he doesn't have weapons of mass destruction, should we go into Iraq? I'd say, you're out of your own mind, of course we're not going to go into Iraq. But if you say he has weapons of mass destruction and he's tried to kill President Bush, President George W. Bush, after he left office because Saddam Hussein was a genuine murderer and he's going to try again, then I would have said yes. So in retrospect, no, I don't believe we should have gone into Iraq, but none of us had the knowledge not to go into Iraq. Well, let's, let's start with Afghanistan. What, what went well? As you said, that was a response to a horrible tragedy that was caused uh, on the American people and we needed to respond. Um, what, what is your assessment of the situation in Afghanistan from the early days to now? Why did we go into Afghanistan? We didn't give a darn about those tribes that are hurtling headlong into the ninth century in the middle of nowhere. We went in only because that was the launching pad from which Americans were killed. So our objective when we went in was to destroy the terrorists. We initially succeeded in two months, but then when the terrorists were trapped in a group of mountains on the Af Afghan-Pakistan border called Tora Bora, we lost our nerve as a nation and as a military and as a political entity. And by that I mean here they were on this border between Pakistan and Afghanistan, the people who had killed us. And what did General Franks, who was our commander, do? He froze and he didn't go over the border to finish them off. What did President Bush do? He froze and he said, you're right, we can't go across the border. What did the Congress do? They said, you're right, you can't go across a border. What did the American public and the press? We all said, that's right, we can't go across a border. Looking back, that was nuts. You have 3,000 dead Americans and you're at the top of a mountain in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden your social climate of your country has changed such that you don't finish the bad guys? That was wrong, but we all did it as an entire nation and we've paid a price ever since. We could have finished that battle and then we could have turned around to the Afghans and said, you guys take care of yourselves. We're not over here to take care of you. We're not going to, Mother May I isn't part of us. We're not going to be here and rebuild a country or something. But we didn't. Instead, we stayed inside Pakistan and President Bush, and I think this was wrong. I thought it then, I, th I think it now, and I've written it in my books. President Bush and General Petraeus and other generals, and I believe they were wrong too, they basically said it is the duty under a counterinsurgency doctrine for our military, our soldiers and marines to be nation builders as well as warriors. And right there I think we went way off the track because all of a sudden we were using our military. We did it in Iraq and then we did it in Afghanistan to try to build a nation. Well. Our military has no particular capacity to do that. In fact, I don't believe you can run around the country, run around the world building other people's nations for them. But we tried to do it. And everyone said, yeah, that's the right thing to do. And so I th believe that our entire nation was too wealthy. I, w things were too easy for us in the 1990s. We thought we had money to do everything. And now we've learned the hard way that we don't. So as a nation, we made a mistake. So it sounds like your assessment is that we started making mistakes early on in the Afghan intervention, and have we continued to make them, or have we done anything right in your estimation? I believe the essential mistake was the political mistake of saying we're going, once we're in Iraq or Afghanistan, we're going to stay and build them as democratic nations. That was because President Bush said he had what he called his freedom agenda, that we had an obligation to help other peoples. No, we don't, in my judgment. So I thought that that concept was wrong. But then our military, I think, bought into it, hook, line, and sinker. What I thought was sensible for our military then and now is to say, stop, what's my job? My job is to look after the security of the United States of America. What does that mean? That means I go after the terrorists, and then somebody said, well, you can't just leave a country. No, you can't. Therefore, the first thing I have to do, the first duty of our military, is to build up a good, 
tough indigenous military, both in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we didn't do it. In neither case did we do it. So I don't cheer our military as though, bravo, all the generals did everything right. No, they didn't. And I just look at a general the way I'd look at anybody else who rises in a corporation. You can have good CEOs and you can have mediocre CEOs. You can have good presidents and mediocre presidents. Now, in the last, in the last year, we've suddenly changed in Afghanistan and we're now saying we have to have advisors to build up the Afghan army to let them fight their own battle and we'll pull out. I approve, I think, you know, I'm just a journalist, but I think that's the right thing to do. But I think it came 10 years too late. What would you have done in I Afghanistan? I would have started on, on day one. I would have said our first job is to build them up because commonsensically it's the only way we're going to get out of there. But, you know, we're all prisoners of our own history. See, I had a combined action platoon in Vietnam. That's what I did from the first day I was there. So it was, it was the, the instinct that I had. Don't do it for others. Make them do it for themselves. But we built up a, a military that was so powerful that we believed we could do anything and we didn't need others to help us. That was wrong. So you build up that capability. Do you think by now we would have been long gone from Afghanistan? Yes. There are no more terrorists left in Afghanistan, a handful. The terrorists live in Pakistan. Pakistan is our friendly enemy, a hostile friend. I don't know which oxymoron you want to use, both apply. But Pakistan believes that sooner or later we're going to pull out of Afghanistan. And when that happens, they want to put a government in there that will be a satrap of theirs that they'll be able to control because they're, they, they see India running around the entire world trying to box in Pakistan. So the Pakistanis are the ones that allow the Taliban, who are the terrorists, to still exist. If the Pakistanis wanted to take action, there would be no more serious war within one year. What about in Iraq? Would, it, oh, Iraq. would we have been in and out of there as quickly if we had done what you just recommended in terms of building up the indigenous capability, or was that a completely different situation? Iraq. Iraq has an educated middle class. It also has a terrific bitterness between 10 million Sunnis and 20 million Shiites. Our huge mistake in Iraq, again, was a political mistake. President Bush put all of our troops at risk over there. And he seemed like a good guy in a lot of ways, and he really did care for them. So I'm not trying to say he didn't care for them. But he didn't study, in my judgment, the way he should have to understand war and to understand what he was doing. And by that, I mean this. He and Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, Secretary of State Rice went to Representative Pelosi, who was in charge of the Democratic House of Representatives. And Ms. Pelosi and Ms. Rice agreed that America as a democracy had no right interfering in the elections of other countries. And General President Bush said, that's absolutely right. So we went through all of this. We spent a half a trillion dollars. We had 5,000 people die. And in the end, when it's time to make an election, and we had this one Iraqi by the name of Alawi, who was a reasonable guy asking for our help, meaning give me some money so I can help win this election. We said, oh, no, we can't, we can't interfere. We can't give you a penny. So what did Iran do? Iran said, hey, who's our boy? Well, our boy is a fellow by the name of Maliki. How many hundreds of millions of dollars do you need? And so Iran backed the parties they wanted, and we were, we were so, I think, naive on the one hand, but so, oh, well, you don't do that in a democracy, that we let Iraq slip away so that now you have Prime Minister Maliki in charge. Prime Minister Maliki may have some good attributes. I'd have to think about that for a moment. But the, the attribute that he doesn't have is tolerance of, of Sunnis. 
he is a very sectarian man who carries a big chip on his shoulder relative to the Sunnis. So Prime Minister Maliki, whom, whom we basically put in and said, oh, this is an election, he now is not only the Prime Minister, but he has kept the Minister of Defense and the Minister of Interior, which is the FBI and the CIA combined, as part of his portfolio. What's that called? Mubarak. So I, I think we, 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 and then President Obama, and I don't think this was right either, President Obama didn't put pressure on to have us stay there. If he, if he had, we would have stayed. But instead, President Obama said, I made a campaign promise and we're getting out. So reasonably, I look at this and I say, oh, terrific. We fought for six years. I'm a grunt. I just love those, those young men who are out there on the front lines. And it, it, it gets me angry to, to watch our politicians and other politicians at the top screw it up so that are we better off with Saddam Hussein in Iraq and us not going in or us having gone in, spent that treasure, spent that blood, and having Maliki aligned with the Iranians in the end. I prefer not to be able to, not to have to answer that question because I don't think we've done a good job. I don't think President Bush did a good job and I don't think President Obama did a good job. So is that where we are in Afghanistan on the one hand, uh, facing a situation where we will leave and Pakistan will exert influence and in Iraq uh, facing a situation where uh, we will leave and Iran will exert influence and, and then what comes next? We have agreed to leave Iraq. That's done. And Maliki clearly is listening more carefully to Iran than he is to us. Does that make a huge difference? In a lot of ways it does. You look at countries like Saudi Arabia and basically what they're saying is, hey, United States, congratulations on really screwing that up. So Iraq has not turned out well. Afghanistan, we don't know. Afghanistan is still unpredictable. There are certain things you can with high confidence say and certain things you can't with any confidence say. What's the high confidence thing you can say about Afghanistan? That Pakistan will remain a pain in the neck for the foreseeable future. It will remain a sanctuary for the terrorists. You can say that's going to happen because it is. But what's going to happen in Afghanistan? Well, I don't think any reasonable person should try to predict that because the variables that are going to affect that outcome are, none of us know what they're going to be. Let me give you the example. Who's going to be the next president? Well, if it's President Obama, we know he said, I want us out of combat by 2014. But if it's, if it's a Republican president, we know that we'll be staying longer. And we don't know who's going to be the president. That's only part of it, though, John, because the other part is, who's going to be calling the shots in Afghanistan? We now have President Karzai, who is unreliable. President Karzai, in my judgment, as just an individual human being, is, uh, in my judgment, is erratic. And he's not, as our ambassador Eikenberry said, he is not a reliable strategic partner. But He's leaving in 2014. Well, who replaces him? Will it be somebody who's reliable and a real leader for Afghanistan? Or will it be somebody like Karzai? So I have no way of saying how uh, Afghanistan is going to end up because the, the huge variables that are going to cause the difference are still two years in the future, and we have no idea of, of knowing how those things are going to turn out. More and more questions and complications. Going back to Iraq then, mm. uh, what happens there? You mentioned the divide between the Sunni and the Shia, not the Kurds. How does that fit into all of this? The Kurds are very pro-American. They have oil in their area in the northeast of Iraq. They have played their political cards very shrewdly. They are a force that is for stability that you can deal with. 
Uh, what the Kurds basically are saying, and there are only about 5 million of the 25 million Iraqis, so they're, they're a small portion and they're all together in their area. The, what the Kurds have been saying is to, to Maliki and to the people in Baghdad, just don't push us too far. We're not a pain in the neck to you. We're not asking you for anything. Don't you ask us for too much and we'll still remain part of Iraq. Just allow us to be almost more a confederacy than a federation. I don't see the people who have power in Baghdad trying to push the Kurds too far one way or the other. So Kurdistan, the Kurd part of Iraq, I think, is fairly stable. Where the real problem is going to be is if President, Prime Minister Maliki continues to try to purge the Sunnis out of the army, out of the police, out of any position of power, if he tries to continue to disenfranchise them simply because they're Sunnis, then he is going to cause a restiveness among the Sunnis so that they once again will do what, I'm, I'm not predicting, but I'm saying he's, he's causing a problem here. The problem in 2004 and 2005 was that the Sunnis were simply sort of saying, well, we don't, we don't like the Shiites taking over power. We don't like the fact the Americans have put them in power. We don't particularly like these terrorists, but we're not going to do anything about it. So they had a code of silence. You don't, if you're Maliki, and this is what I know our people are telling them, look, don't get yourself back into that situation because you're not tough enough. You're not tough enough if, if, if those al-Qaeda terrorists begin to get their roots back into the Sunni area. So smarten up, cut a good deal. But, but President Maliki has that very human tendency now that he's been in charge for so long that he, his head is pretty big and he doesn't listen. And he has to be very careful of where he goes in the future. He has to be very careful, very, very careful. It sounds like both outcomes then are pretty pessimistic. From, from your assessment? Well, compared to, compared to the rhetoric of President Bush saying that we, we've established a, a city on a hill that we're going to have a fine democracy in the Middle East because I've begun the first steps, compared to the rhetoric, the reality is, is much more realistic. So if you had to project 10 years into the future, how would you see these two situations? Oh, but, but <laughs> you can't do, get me to do that, though, John, because I can't even give you two years. I know, I know, but <laughs> okay, well. I can say, you, you, you know, that what bothers me, I'm not that bothered by the terrorists in Pakistan because I have watched what we now can do with our military and our, our CIA and our intelligence and our unmanned aerial vehicles, those UAVs with the strikes and how good our cameras are and how good our special forces are, I don't see that we're going to give the terrorists any sanctuary anywhere that we're not continuing to hit them, continuing to hit them. So if I look at a place like Yemen or Somalia, they're as much a problem as Pakistan or Afghanistan, and I think we can handle that. I'm, I'm not worried about Iraq one way or the other. I just think it's a shame what's happening because it was a great opportunity to have a much better democracy than, than Prime Minister Maliki is now delivering to his own people. So that's really a shame. But it, it's not going to affect things for us in a huge way. They're going to sell their oil because they want money, so it's not a big deal. The big deal is Iran with a nuclear weapon. That's a big, big deal. That is a problem about four to ten years away. Israel keeps muttering that they may strike Iran, but they probably won't. We're not, obvi obviously, we're not going to do anything. President Obama has done everything he could to kind of indicate this really isn't a problem. It's not going to be in my watch, blah, blah, blah. So President Obama, who began by saying, well, you know, I can reach a reasonable uh, accommodation with President Ahmadinejad. We'll just sit down and we'll talk. Well, he's been disabused of that because Ahmadinejad keeps sneering at him. But it's, it's clear that President Obama doesn't want to rock any boats in any particular way. So there, most people see an inevitability the way things are going that Iran will have a nuclear weapon within about two to three years. Now, 
Once you have a nuclear weapon, the question is, do you declare it? If the Iranians have any sense at all, they will not declare they have the nuclear weapon. They won't embarrass President Obama, if he's still the president, to the extent that they force a confrontation. They'll just signal the way Israel does that they have a nuke of nuclear weapons. And that will enable them to gain more political and geopolitical power in the region. And so if you're the Saudi Arabia, if you're the Saudis, what do you think? Our mortal enemy now has a nuclear weapon. America's done nothing. Well, I've given an awful lot of money to um, Pakistan. Pakistan has 50 or more nuclear weapons. So I think then you set in, in motion Saudi Arabia buying a nuclear weapon. Now, if you're Turkey, and you believe that, that, that you're more powerful than these states that you look at as being a little bit backward compared to you. Are you going to sit in this neighborhood and not have a nuclear weapon when they have nuclear weapons? I don't think so. So then Turkey has the ability to go out and start working to have its own nuclear weapon. And then you're Egypt. We don't know how Egypt is going to turn out, but we know one thing. Egyptians believe that they are the intelligentsia and they are the leaders of the Middle East. So uh, is, is Egypt with 50 million people going to sit back and say, well, we'll, we'll accept some sort of second-rate position while everyone else has a nuclear weapon? I don't think so. So I believe there'll be a chain reaction that is set off after Iran gets a nuclear weapon. That's, now, by that time, John, I'll, I'll be I don't know, somewhere else, you know, on, the, on the other side. Um, you might still be here, but the next generation is going to be grappling with a problem that's much more severe than we grappled with in Afghanistan or Iraq. So on that dramatic note, we'll end. Thank you very much for joining us today, Mr. West. My pleasure, my pleasure. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time. This program is made possible in part by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office, the Global Connections Foundation, and the India Program at UCF.